Good morning. I guess we could get started. Uh, so, as you can see from the screen, we have a question for you. Uh, if, if you had any troubles with the exercise too, so please let us know. I guess there haven't been any major ones, at least. The only comment that we have is that had no major issues, so 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 that's good. Um, I guess we could today start with going through the exercise too and, and see like the what what solutions or what kind of things you should have done, and they they will shortly uh, give you uh, some explanations about the exercise. But the overall uh, stuff that we will do today is that you want to switch screens. oh yeah that's true let's put this on the right computer so the overview of this week is that we will go through uh, loops and conditional statements so if we want to make decisions uh, so we might want to use some kind of uh, conditions to, to do decisions based on some criteria and, and loops are basically if we want to repeat things so we might consider using loops. So those are the two topics today that we will go through and then in the end I will go through the exercise three and, and tell you a little bit of uh, what you should do in, in that exercise. So the exercise will focus on, on practicing uh, using loops and, and conditions and what kind of uh, really practical <coughs> things you can al already do with these these uh, techniques and tools that we we have at this point of time but maybe if dave starts with going through the exercise too yeah so um for this exercise too i assume at this point all of you are somewhat familiar with what you had to do and uh, and recognize that unless we specify otherwise the exercises are due the week following their assignment at the start of this part of the class so at the start of the lecture um, we may be a little bit flexible for the first week or two but uh, we kind of expect if you're going to turn anything in late you should let us know in advance so that yeah. we're prepared for that. Otherwise, um, generally we do uh, decrease the number of points that you're awarded if things are turned in yeah. late. Yeah, and, and for your own sake, we, we kind of hope that you would try to keep the schedule because we are moving fast. There's a lot of new things coming all the time. And if you are too much behind, it will be quite become quite frustrating for you to to be on the course so yeah so um yeah so our exercise number two was basically um i would say fairly straightforward what we wanted you to learn how to do was a little bit of how to write scripts in python and to use the spider um, editor as well as getting files from GitHub, saving your changes to GitHub, creating a new file and, and putting it into a GitHub repository, basically practicing a lot of the skills that you'll use for the rest of the course. And uh, there were mainly two problems. The first one, you were given a starter script, in this case called Station Ages, and what you had to do was modify the script to fix three problems and, um, and then save each one of those changes to your GitHub repository and then give some kind of description of what was done. So if we look here, um, maybe I'll make this font size just a tiny bit bigger. This is the starter script version of the station ages file. So this is what you would have started working with. And we have a list of names here and a list of years in which those stations became operational. And this is, again, this part of the FMI um, observation station network. So we had three things to fix here. And um, the first, or at least in the, the solution that um, I kind of intended for you to follow, the first thing is to change this selected station. It's currently set to be a number. 
And while it is perfectly fine to use a number as, for instance, an index within this list, um, the way that the rest of the code operates, uh, it expects there to be some name there. So you could, for instance, put Kumpula in place of the one that was there. If you do that, then what this station index will do is it will look up the name of whatever is set for a selected station and return the index value of that station within this list. And so that will, uh, I think there was a hint that said you shouldn't change lines 39 and 40 in the starter script. Uh, and the reason for that was we wanted to guide you in the direction of this modification. Um, in addition, there's an issue here with the uh, operational years. So you can see that when it looks up in this list station start years, which are given here, it uses selected station rather than an index value. So if you put text in here uh, as a location on the list, it's going to return an error saying that it expects to have some kind of numerical value. So this should be, instead of selected station, station index. And I hope that, uh, that you found that change as well. The last thing in there is simply a typo. And if you look through the print statement here, you can already see it in Spider. There's this little yellow triangle here that's saying there's something wrong. And sure enough, on the last line here, we have a missing quotation mark um, at the end of the print statement. And so that would have given a syntax error if you tried to run that. If you fix those three things and save your script when you press play, over here, for instance, you'll see the Helsinki Kumpula station has been operational for 12 years. So I guess probably most of you found um, most of those changes. And, uh, and the idea here was really just to kind of get you a little bit of practice working with lists and working with, uh, with the index values. Are there any questions about this problem one? Yeah, I guess so. All right, so for problem two, and I'll just jump back here to the problem description for just a second. Um, here you had to make your own Python script and save it to your GitHub repository. And in this case, you were given some annual average temperature for each month during the year from the Helsinki Malmi airport. And what we wanted to do was just have a simple script that would allow you to specify a month and then print out what the average temperature was for that month using a format that looks something like this. And again, the idea here was you had two lists and you just had to kind of figure out how to get the information from the two lists uh, so that you would look up, for instance, March and you would find the corresponding temperature in the list of temperatures. So um, rather than write this script out uh, as we sit here, I'm just going to show you my solution. And uh, there are, I think, several different ways you could solve this same problem. I think this is probably the solution that's closest to problem one. So um, I think in some ways that's a kind of nice, simple solution. But here, basically, we had to start by making a list of months and then making a list of the average temperatures. And then, again, just like we did previously, we had this variable for selecting the item within the list. It was for selecting stations earlier in problem one. Now it's for selecting a month. So I put in, for instance, March. This could be May or any other month. It doesn't matter. And then we look for what is the position of this selected month within the month index. So we want to find the corresponding position of the fifth month of the year should be the fifth month or fifth temperature in the list, right? And then print that out. So uh, the average temperature in selected month, that again is a character string, so that's just fine to print, is, and then average temps with this index that we looked up. Uh, so again, if I run this, I see the, the average temperature in Helsinki in May is 10 degrees. Any questions about that one? Yeah. Uh, I did it in another way. I mean, the results was the same, but I don't know. Uh, that would look really nice and better. Uh, I guess so. But I did something like selecting March, default March, and then in the square brackets. 
Yeah, I mean, it's what you're going to see as we go further on in the course is that there's lots of different ways to get the same solution in Python. Now, we're going to show you some things that are perhaps good programming practices, like today when we talk about for loops, where you're going to repeat calculations. It's much better to do that with some kind of loop that goes through and uses the same code to do a, a calculation than to copy and paste a hundred times the code making one change on each line, right? So, in some respects, I would say your solution might actually be a little bit safer because you choose the index value and that essentially guarantees you're going to get the same location in both lists. Um, you know, it also prevents things like if I went here to, and did selected month and put a lowercase m for May instead of a capital M, when I run the script, it's not going to be able to find that value in the list and it could, you know, returns a value error that says, hey, this isn't in my list, so too bad. Um, there are some tricks to get around that problem, but uh, but yeah, it, it, it's a perfectly fine solution, it sounds like. Any other questions about problem two? Problem three was basically about putting things into Markdown in GitHub, and I don't really think we need to go through that unless there are some problems that you folks had. Um, If there are, Slack is a good place to put questions about Markdown things. We'd be happy to answer questions there uh, and to show you examples if you want to know how to do things in Markdown. Both Hendrik and I have uh, a fair amount of experience with trying to format things nicely in Markdown. So we can give you some tips about how to do nice code blocks and other things if you feel like that's something you want to include in your solutions. Um, otherwise, yeah, anything else about this exercise number two, or shall we move on? Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, so then the actual content. So, as said, so we start with this idea of, of looping things, so repeating things using programming. And let's take one material here. Okay, so let's start by doing a little experiment trying to uh, print out letters of words. So basically, let's uh, define a variable called world, word and put uh, text snow in there. And, and in this case, so the idea uh, for me is that I want to print out each letter that we have on this word. And, and of course, we, we already know how to kind of take things from uh, lists uh, or actually take things from text as well. So, of course, we can print out, for example, the first, uh, first uh, letter of that word by saying that word uh, and then the square brackets zero. So in this case, I would print out the letter S from this word. And so it seems to do. So, okay. What about the second one? So if I want to go through all of these letters one by one, I could do it like this so that I print out and change the index value of the word like this. And we would end up having all of these letters of that that word uh, printed out here. But of course, as you can already, uh, you can guess, this is really, really in uh, inefficient way of, of doing this. So how could we do this more easy? Uh, is that basically, well, first I will show you actually another word. Uh, so if we continue doing this, this same uh, idea that we have another word and I put ice in here 
Uh, and then what about doing the same thing? So of course I can al already print out the uh, first letter. So it's I, then the second one C, and the third one E. But then in the first one we had four letters. So what about now when we actually have only three? So what if I try to print out word at index three? So of course, because we don't have any letter at that point, so you will end up having this kind of error, string index out of range. So if doing and printing stuff in this manner, you might end up uh, actually having troubles uh, when, when printing and getting the letters one by one. So what we can do with for loops is that we can basically uh, take and repeat word, uh, one letter at a time and do, do the printing no matter how long or short the word is. So if thinking of doing the printing like this and you might have a letter that is actually uh, 150 uh, letters long so you might need to have quite many printing sentences and, and statements in, in, the, in the code and of course that is really uh, laborious and, and, and insufficient. So now let's see how we can actually do this in a more uh, suitable way. So I put this word snow here. So how we do this kind of for loop is that as the name already says, the for statement should always start with this keyword for. And then we give some kind of variable name that could be anything. In this case, I said for car, such as character, in word. So what we are actually doing here now is that we are basically looping over this word snow. It could be whatever uh, kind of text, it could be snowball, snow castle or whatever. But basically what we do is that we go one letter at a time over this word. And what is important in here is that when we do the for loop is that you start with for, you have some kind of variable name in this word snow. And then you put a colon uh, at the end. This is really important as well. So how you define for loops is like this. And then you put enter and we end up in this uh, indentation uh, on, the, on the next row. So how you do for loops is that you use these uh, words or terms here. Then you do an indentation. So typically it's four spaces, so one, two, three, four, like this. And then you do something with the, uh, in this case, this cap car uh, variable that we have. And of course, as we want to print out the car characters of the snow, we say that print uh, car. So what we are doing is that we, we define the variable and the content of this word. So one letter at a time goes into this car and what we are doing is that we print out what the letter is. So when I execute this, we have snow printed one letter at a time. And of course I could do snowball raising, I don't even know what that is, but word can be anything and when I do this again with the same statement, it will print out the stuff. Also the, the space in between our, our letter. So this is the kind of way how we do these kind of uh, for loops in, in, uh, in Python. And let's see, so I go here and show you the... Da, da, da materials. So the idea 
of for loop is that you have some kind of variable such as this in some collection and this collection can be a string uh, so that you have each letters in there and you can look over those it can be also a list of values and that is quite often the case so that what we are actually wanting to look over is some kind of list of values and you want to manipulate or do some kind of analysis with those those values so this is the basic idea so that you are looping over the collection have the variable determined here and do some things with that variable so it's quite a uh, uh, easy way of defining for loops in, in python in some other languages it might be uh, a bit more tricky or it's quite logical but but still you need to do it uh, have more code to actually produce this kind of for loop and as said here so the variable can be any name you like so you can really name it as you want it can be variable it, it can be character if you are looping over numbers it can be for example number or, or whatever so you can really decide yourself the main thing is that when you start to do something with the value in your list or collection you need to kind of uh, use that name that you have defined in here so that is the main point and also really important thing is that you need to indent so all the codes that you want to do so if I would like to do things with this variable uh, like print it then if this would be a number I would like to uh, add some or make a sum of that number with some other so all those sentences that you want to look over and, and iterate many times you need to have them as a code block that is indented so that those are the basic things to remember Okay, yeah. So, for those of you who've used other programming languages, this is something that is somewhat unique to Python. I don't know of any other language that does, you know, looping or things like this by indentation. So normally you have to have either some kind of bracket that indicates you've ended your loop, or you know, if you're one of the fossils like me who still uses Fortran, you have to have an end if or an end do statement, something that would say this is the end of my stuff I want to have in the loop. Yeah. Here it's really nice in Python because it, it forces you to write kind of clean code by indenting everything, but yeah. it also makes it very easy that you just don't have these extra statements in there when yeah. at the end of a loop or yeah. whatever. Yeah, and exactly. And, and basically, how long do we actually do stuff inside that loop is that as, as much uh, commands and statements you have indented, so that is basically all those stuff will be repeated uh, we, uh, inside each loop. And then when you have uh, another command that is not intended, so it's basically on, on the same, uh, in the beginning of, of your uh, script, on the same level as, as this for, so then the loop stops and it will start uh, proceeding as, as, as normally one command at a time. So and just Again, one small thing to add to that is what this means is you can have comments and things like that in there. You can have blank lines. As long as it's all indented to the same level, it's considered part of the same. Yeah. So you can format your code still in kind of a nice, easy to read way. Just because it's in a loop doesn't mean like everything has to have no spaces between the lines. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So you'll see examples of this as we go on. But um, yeah. Yeah. indentation is going to be a common issue. Yeah. And there's a one <clears throat> kind of everyday life example. So kind of thinking of repeating things. So you can, of course, think of your own life. And, and you, you can think this my life here as basically the, the days of your lives. And, and basically we are iterating over. So we are actually going one day by day and we are actually repeating things. So this is, for example, quite typical for me that I, I wake up in the morning then the next function i do is that i take a shower then i eat breakfast uh, then i brush teeth then i go to work and and, and so on so it's this kind of repetitive uh, thing that 
comes every day and, and you repeat it uh, day after day. So, so this is kind of everyday example of, of loops that you can think of. Good. Uh, then let's continue uh, with the examples in Inspire. So one kind of uh, nice thing that you can do with with uh, loops and is that you can actually count things and and keep track of how many times certain things have been looped. Looped. So we can determine this uh, variable called length and we set it as zero. So the length is zero at the moment. And then if we want to count the letters in, in some specific word such as uh, blizzard. So now as you can see, we determine this variable letter and the collection that we are looping over is now this word here. So you don't need to necessarily even uh, define the one that you are actually looping over beforehand, but you can actually define it here inside this for loop statement. So uh, what I will do now is that I want to count how many uh, letters is there in that word blizzard. And let's put that uh, length is length uh, plus one. So what happens here is that basically we loop over each uh, letter in this word and then we add one to the length variable that we have here. So let's see. Uh -huh. I have some typo here. Uh, okay, need to learn how to spell the thing. Now I do it like this, so it works. Although this is misspelled, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so basically, what we have here now is that we have the length variable and you don't at the moment see anything. So what we did was that we updated the value in this, this variable length that we defined here to be zero. So let's see how many letters do we have. So there are length, this is really bad but it doesn't matter. Okay, there are eight letters in this word. So, and this can again be anything. It could be a longer word, it could be even a whole sentence with one, one text block, or then it can be a list of values. Uh, and, and basically you can this way find, find out how many, how many items you have in that collection. Cool. Uh, then we define that, okay, we have letter X. And when we print out the content of, of that letter, we can see that, yes, it is indeed X. Okay. Uh, then what happens if we do so that for letter in word sleet and then we print the letter like this so think a while what what do you think that will happen in this case so what do we end up having so at this point of time we have the content of the letter is X, but what happens if we do it like this, that we actually define for letter in sleet? So just a few seconds, think what might be the outcome and the content of that letter. So if we do like this, okay, great. It printed out each letter of that word sleet as, as we already saw with the earlier examples. What do you think that is the uh, 
uh, content of that variable later at this point of time. Well, so we know. Basically, when we check the content, it is the last item of that word. So it's T. So basically, what happened here is that we, yeah, we defined this letter variable to be X. But right away, when we started using the same variable name in this uh, for loop, it replaced the value of, of that letter variable being each one of these characters one by one. So this is quite uh, important and, and sometimes when doing programming and there is something fishy happening with your code and you don't necessarily understand, there might be cases that you actually use uh, same variable names in the code and you're like, what, what, what is happening here? So you might have actually used this letter in, inside a for loop and then you might earlier had defined the same variable with some value that you uh, expect to use later on. Yeah. If, so how does this loop know what to print? So basically the, the functionality of, of, of for loop is that you how you define the, the loop is that you uh, you determine that you want to do the loop with for and then you specify any kind of name uh, so it can be a variable called letter and then how the functionality in Python works that it kind of iterates over the collection so iterates over the characters of any kind that you specify here or iterate over one by, one, by one uh, the contents of, of a list and it goes so that it starts from the beginning and, and goes until we have reached the last item and then it stops. So that's the kind of idea. And, and in this case, we go one by one these letters and then we, in this case, we print, print out the letter one by one and we have it like this in the end. Perhaps something that would be useful just to think about is Python sees this list of characters in the word sleep essentially like it would see a list. So it just sees, like if you look at the way the characters are handled in Python, in many ways it's similar to how you deal with list data. So we'll see examples of, of using for loops with lists where maybe it's a little bit more obvious. In this case, it basically sees each character as sort of a separate thing. Yeah, yeah and, and this works well with, with text and, and with lists. But we can, let's see if we actually do so that we specify some decimal number here. So what happens? So we can see that it produces an error because this decimal number, so it's, it's one value and it's not iterable. So you cannot actually iterate over, over values in, in this sense. With, with a text and, and characters you can do it because you can basically specify that the first kind of item in that word is, is letter S or L and, and so on. But basically, if we would do the same uh, with this number, actually the, the meaning of, of the item changes. And, and that's, that's kind of not what we want. Uh, yeah. Um, cool. Then, yeah. Does that, just to kind of check with you folks, does that make sense what the difference is between trying to do this with a number versus a string of characters? You know, I see at least a few people nodding or giving some indication of understanding. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Okay, so, uh, when these uh, for loops become really handy is that if you want to loop over uh, a set of numbers. So let's say that I want to loop over first five numbers that we have starting from zero as we are uh, doing Python programming here. So we can say that for value in 
So this is the basic, uh, basic thing that you always do with for loop. And then we have this function called range. And this is really handy function as we can say that for value in range 5 and let's see what this does then we just print the value so great so in this case what we do is that we use this range function to kind of produce a, a sequence of number starting from 0 until the, the number so this is basically showing how many numbers should I produce so in this case I produce five numbers starting from zero and ending at four because in Python we basically uh, so as we when we count these we have actually five numbers in, in here so this is this can be really really handy in, in many cases and let's see one Good thing. So if you want to find help, like how does this function range works? So you can use in IPython uh, this function called help, which is quite obvious. And then you put the name of the function inside. And when doing this, we have a lot of text happening and coming here. Uh, and when we this up and when we scroll up we we see that we have some kind of information and documentation how this range function works so we can say that it's a class range so it's basically a function called range and and then we have uh, this kind of ways to use the range so you, you can define range and then use uh, specify the stop uh, parameter and what we mean by stop is that basically give me the place when I should stop iterating over these values in this in this case and 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 for example in our example we should stop at when we reach uh, the fifth uh, item so that's the way but then there is also a second way of using this so you can specify that start from certain number, stop at certain number and use certain step. So you can actually skip over certain certain values, say that I want to print out every second number, for example. And for this purpose, we have for you a little poll to do. So Thinking of, as we now saw how this range function works, so how would you use that range function to produce these numbers here? So we want to produce numbers, so we iterate over the values and we want to print out number 2, number 5 and then number 8. So I guess, did you, so it should be on. So, uh, yeah, the screen is not up for it, but there's yeah. there. So, here is a question. So, so what of these uh, possibilities will produce the one that we uh, have here? So, which option will produce this one? So Go to the poll and select the one that you think that will produce produce the result that we want to have. And rather than typing this into Python, which you of course could do, we'd like you to think about it first and then maybe test your idea in Spider if you need to. But it's it's better that you don't just start right away into the seeing you know which numbers you can get away or copying and pasting the five options in and seeing which one works. So, yeah, I don't know, maybe take a minute or two to think about it, yeah. and we'll take a look at the yeah. responses uh, in just a moment. Now we don't give you the wisdom of crowd, so you need to think yourself and then make a decision. So let's wait a while and then we see what is the outcome.
So one good place to start thinking and finding information is to actually go and see the documentation that I just showed you. Maybe we can maybe we can see what you have ended up. Okay, this is this is good. So this is what you think. So most of you think that is two, eight, and three. Uh, then there is two, nine, and three. Five of you, and then there is zero. 9 and 2. They are good, uh, good options, everyone. Uh, the correct one in this case is this. So 2, 9 and 3. Uh, most of you took off this one and it's quite obvious and it's maybe something that has also kind of confused me a little bit. But when we take a look of the documentation of this uh, range function, so we said that when should we start? So yeah, as we want to have the numbers 2, 5 and 8, we should start at number 2, as specified here, here and also here. So most of you thought of correctly that it should at least beginning begin with number two <coughs> and then uh, when we take a look that what is the difference between these numbers so you need to add three uh, to get from two to five and then you need to add another three to get from five to eight so the second uh, the step that you need to take should be three and as here and here, so the last uh, value in this uh, uh, in this range function defines the step, and it is three as specified in these these two uh, options that we have here. But then the tricky part is that when should we stop? And most of you said that you should stop at eight. But then actually the correct one answer is that you should stop at 9. So continue until you will face and, and meet the uh, basically the ninth number. So that is kind of the, the thing how it, it, it should work. So we can try this ourselves and see how it, it works. So if I want to print out those for value in range. So I want to start with number 2, then I want to go until 9, and I want that the step between these values is 3. Let's see if I'm... Am I totally wrong or does it work like this? Let's try it out. Indeed, this is how we end up having 2, 5 and 8. Okay, most of you thought that it should go from 2 to 8. Let's try how this works. Yeah, and as you can see, it produces correctly the first two values here. So we have 2 and 5, but then when we end up at having the, the eight, number 8, it doesn't anymore print that, but it actually stops at that point. So when we meet this number 8, then we stop. So if we want to produce the number 8, we, we want to actually go one number uh, kind of ahead of, of the actual value that we want to have. So, so we specify when you should stop, not 
what is the last value that you should print. So that is the kind of uh, idea to, to understand how these for loops and, and the, the range function works in this case. Uh, is this confusing? Yeah? Oh yeah, this you mean this one? <laughs> yeah. I don't actually. Do you know the meaning why they actually use the square brackets? It's it's kind of optional. That uh, that that is what it basically means. But why do they use the square brackets there? Uh, yeah, I, I unfortunately I'm not. I'm not sure either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, one thing about this range function that might help with the kind of uh, what's typically a confusing point is that I mean, if you think you say I want to list the number I start with and the number I end with, that you would include that in the list. Uh, if you look at what output, for instance, when you just do like print out range of five. Is it gives you five numbers. Mm. It starts at zero, and so that's why everything is shifted to be one less. But if you do range with five, the expectation is that will produce five numbers or um, you know, allow you to repeat something five times. So it'd be zero, one, two, three, and four. So it would not include five in that list, which would be then giving you six values. And uh, this is just a, a design choice with Python. It's, for me at least, when I first started using it, it was not at all intuitive. Uh, coming from another programming language where you always listed the start and end values and they were included in whatever you did. Um, it's just a quirk, I think, yeah. about Python that's something unusual. Yeah. But when you think about using the range function with just a single number, it does always return that number of items. Uh, so if you want to you know, do something a hundred times, you can just use range 100 and it will mm. do that. Yeah. Uh, that's the closest thing I found to a reasonable explanation for why Python does this. Yeah. It's basically a decision that the developers of Python programming language once did. And they, well, we don't really know all the reasons uh, why they have done things like they do, but, but I guess they have some good reasons for doing these like this. Okay, uh, but unless you have any questions about the range function that we just did, we could move forward. So, as I said already in the beginning, is that really typical case when you use a for loop is that you actually have a list of values that you iterate. So let's now try that one. So let's create a variable called my list and let's then put some values there so 0 0.0, 1 0, 1.0, 0, 2.0 and so on. So yeah, so now we have a list with five values and we can check that indeed that variable my list now contains these five numbers that we have here. So let's see. Uh, we can, of course, the first thing that we can do is that we can print out the values of the list. So for value in, and now what we put here is that the values in my list and then print the value. So we can see that, okay, indeed we have the values and now what we did was that we looped over one number at a time and then we printed out the value. Then uh, what we can also do is that because we have this uh, list of values, 
and we can do all sorts of stuff inside this indentation. So inside the loop we can do and modify the values in our list. So let's see if we do like this. For i as index, we have already talked to you many times about index values. So i is really typical way of uh, when, when you <coughs> define a loop, so you use the letter i to uh, stand for index. So for i in range 6, uh, let's do so that I say that uh, oh, my list i equals to my list i plus i. So this might seem a bit uh, confusing here, but basically what we are now doing is that we basically iterate over six times and we uh, basically each number will be determined in this i uh, variable. And what we do here is that we take one number, so my list at index i, so the first number is my list at index zero, as we start iterating over the numbers from zero until <laughs> five. So the first number uh, will be defined here. And what we are actually doing is that as we have the number zero here, we are actually taking that in here. And what we are actually doing is that we plus the number i. So basically, let's see what happens. And then we can discuss about what did we actually do here. So now I updated the values in this list. And when we print, we see that okay, we actually modified this my list in here. And now instead of having numbers from 0 to 5, we actually have numbers from 0 to 10. And why is it like this? So the reason is that basically the reasons are here. We are actually taking the no original number that we had there in the list by this uh, statement here and what we did was that we added the number that we looped over. So when we think of the, the first iteration here is that okay I take the number 0 here and then I add the number 0 because the first number that we loop over in, in this range is, is 0. So as an outcome we actually end up having the number 0 here in the, in the final list and the, in the end result. Then when we go to the next iteration so the first number is 0, the next one is 1. So if we think of range function, you iterate over numbers one, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the next one is number 1. And then basically what we do again is that we update the next value of that list by taking the value that was there and adding the number that we are looping over here which is number one. So one plus one is two. So we end up having the number two here. And then we again move forward to the next iteration. So now we have number two here. So again we take the third number. So my list at index two is zero one two. So number two here. Then we update it and add the uh, arrival i which is number two at that point and we end up being at number four at that point and this continues un until we reach the end of of this this list so what we did was that we really we took the values from the list and then we actually updated the same list that we we are actually we iterated over is this something that you did you follow 
what happened. So we take the number from a list, then we do something and actually update the same value of, of, that, of that list. So we iterate one value at a time, do something and update it. Go to the next value, do something and update it. And, and so on. And do this until we actually reach the end of, of that list. Yeah, so it's basically the length of the list and that's a good point as we are actually next going to that one. So yeah, here we defined number six, but of course, what if we would have list with 10 numbers, then you should write number 10 and with 15 and so on. So of course, there's no, no point of actually this doing this kind of hard coding, specifying how many times you should iterate over. It would be much better if we actually check like how many values do we have that on that list and then we repeat that many times whatever we are doing for, for that list. So let's see how we can actually do that. That was a really excellent question. So what if we do so that we actually say that for i, so we start in a similar manner in range so everything is the same as before, but we want to know how many values there are. And we went, was it last week when we actually checked how many times or how many letters there are? Or did we go already with this function? I guess we have. Well, if not, there is this Python function called length. And, and this is really useful thing and, and function to count things. So you can count uh, and get the length of, of certain word, for example, so how many word, uh, letters there are in, 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 in Blizzard, for example, or, or some whatever text. But in, in, in same manner, you can also uh, see how many items there are in a list. So basically, if we would do it like this, so I could do for i in range, my list and inside these parentheses you define what you want to count. So in this case I want to count the, the items in, 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 my, in my list and then it produces, it basically gives you the number of, of how many items and then we feed that number into this range function. So there is actually kind of nested uh, function inside this range. So we, we can this in this way kind of chain different uh, Python functions in, inside each other and it will produce what we want. So let's do the same thing. So now we have these values in our list. So let's do in a similar manner that my list i equals to my list i plus i. So we, we are doing the same thing uh, as, as before, but now of course our starting values are different than, than, than earlier. So we are actually updating this list that we already updated before. So let's see what happens if we do, do this and then print the result. Okay, so now we have again an updated version of, of that list. So in a similar manner, we have added some values in here. And now we have, uh, instead of having numbers from zero to five, we have actually values from zero to 15. And, and what, it, what was different in this case now was that we didn't specify how many times you should do it. Instead, let the, let the computer do the calculation for you and, and basically uh, check that, okay, there are this many items here, so do this n number of times, basically the number of times how many values you have there. And then we have the same result. So this is of course much more, much better way of, of doing this, these things. Cool. Uh, yeah.
yeah so basically what we have is that when we when we update the values in these these lists so we kind of you can think it in a similar manner that if we specify a variable a and say that it's one and then we check the value of a well it is one then when we update the value is that basically we just create the same item a second time and and we kind of replace it so so basically the, the idea is that you cannot go back in time to see what it was before once you have updated it then then that is what you're working with so i don't know if you have any uh, other suggestion of, of this but but basically they are done in that manner that basically updating is is not uh, it's kind of what it seems but what we are actually doing is that we are replacing the values in in that list so there is no way of actually going back once you have done it yeah uh, yeah Mm -hmm. So how how we update the values? You mean? Yeah, and what, why did it do this value? Yeah. So basically, what we did here is that we have this set of values in this my list, and and basically we so in this point we already did this once. So we were already up. We have already updated the values from. Uh, 0 to 5 to 0 to 10 because we we actually did this uh, for loop in in here but then we actually instead of using the original list uh, so in this case we are actually updating the already updated version of that list and and what we are doing here is that basically okay uh, so this is basically the the one that says that update so replace the value in my list at index one by and what value do we actually replace is that the list that uh, the, the value that was at that uh, index plus i so plus the number that we are iterating over here so so that is kind of the uh how, how things are done so we are actually taking the value there and updating it with something and that's kind of how it goes I don't know did you get the or what was that the thing that you you asked yeah so the uh, for loops are so that it might be a bit kind of uh, confusing when you start but when you kind of get the idea then it becomes quite natural and, and, and easy to understanding but in the beginning at least I remember when I started programming I had kind of same issues of understanding what is actually going on on there yeah I mean one thing we could do we could draw on the chalkboard if you'd like to see like the before and after of my list if you think that would be helpful or is everyone kind of clear about how this goes at this point it would be no problem to just put it on the board so that you can see what you start, what you add, and what you end up with, if you think that would be helpful. Uh, unfortunately, it won't go very well with our screen capture, well, but we uh, try. yeah, we can try to get the uh, in here, and I'll try to kind of put this up high enough that we can see, but if my list starts out, and I'm going to draw it just kind of in this notation that's uh, used for, I don't know, things like vectors and math. Um, but if we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, is that, can you see that all right? All the way in the back, I'm, I know it's probably not ideal. Um, that's our starting values. And so that's our original my list. And what we're going to do is go through each time and take whichever value is here and add to it the value of i. And so we could, in some sense, think of i, um, since the range function basically returns a list of numbers, we could also think of i as being a similar kind of list. And as it turns out,
it's actually basically the same as um, as my list in the way that, that things work out. So when you do the range of five, you get, or I guess range of six in this case, you get zero, one, two, three, four, five. All we're going to do then is just go to each one of these rows and add the two numbers together. So that my list, if we want to consider the updated version, um, you know, Uh, maybe we'll call it my list. Well, we'll just call it my list after they're added together. All we do is just take zero and zero, add those together. Of course, that's still zero. We add the ones. And go through like that. So if you look at the, the way that the for loop is written, it's for i in range length of my list. Length of my list is six, and so range of six numbers. Go through, take the value that's at position zero, and add to it i, which is equal to zero at that position. Take the value of position one, and add to it i, which is equal to one. And as you go through, you end up with that updated version of my list. If you do that a second time, you can easily think about it as just adding these same values of i to the updated version of my list, and that's how you get to the 0, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 version of my list. Does that help at all to see it that way? I mean, this is basically the same way of representing the kind of information that's shown on the screen there, but uh, sometimes, for me at least, it helps to see it this way. So, yeah. Are there other questions about this? I know someone was in the back, but like, seemed like they had a question before. Well, it is in this case because we're using, we're basically replacing the value of i with something that comes from the range function. If you give just a single number in the range function, it's always going to be starting at zero and going up by values of one. If you wanted i to start with something else, then you would list the starting value of two, but then you would also have to list some ending value in order for Python to recognize that you're starting with something other than zero. So if, if thinking the, the question that we asked you, how to produce numbers two, five, and eight, then basically we would iterate three times, so we have, but the i would be, in the first case, it would be two, in the second case, it would be five, and in the third case, it would be eight. So then basically, you end up having a loop that goes three times, but 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 the values of, of the i uh, variable there would be totally different. But, but this is by far the most typical case that you use so that you are actually iterating over from zero to until how many times you want to iterate. So that's how it typically goes. And very often it's the case that you give a list and you want to modify every single value in that list. Yeah. If you wanted to skip values or something like that, you can, but it's just it's far less common to do something like that than it is to update every single one of the values. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, then uh, let's, there are just uh, one minor thing still, so we already knew, know quite a lot of about uh, looping over values of list, but of course as we have the values inside this list and as we learned last week is that you can actually add stuff into this list. So let's do so that we take the my list and then we add a value there. So let's add a value 18 into there. So my list dot append. So this is the Python function of adding something to that list. And let's see what do we have. So yes, indeed. So we had these six numbers and now we added one more, this number 18 that we have here. Let's do once more and add number 21 into the same list and let's see that okay cool yeah now we have these values so as said so if you use the length function to define 
the uh, length of your list. You don't need to change anything uh, of the loop that we did. So now if we want to again update the values with the indices that we we have, so the number from zero to how many times do we have. So instead I don't need to actually write anything new, I can just use the uh, up uh, arrow in the keyboard and find okay this is the uh, stuff that I wrote. So now even though our list has changed this will work as before and we can try it out. Yeah, no, no troubles here. Uh, everything seems to be working and indeed now we have updated the values and, and it has worked correctly. So we now updated the each, each value with the i that we have here. If I would have used uh, the, the original version of the range function that we used, so we actually did it like this, so we had the number 6 in here. Well, it would actually work. Well, let's see what happens. So this is the the list that we are now updating and now we use the range 6 in here and let's see what happens. Okay, it didn't produce any error, but let's see the outcome of this. Okay, we, we can see that the first number is the same, the second number has changed, third number has changed, fourth has changed, fifth has changed, sixth has changed, but then these last items, so what we wanted was that we update every number in that list. So the last two didn't actually update because we used the hard-coded number six in here. So what we did was that we iterated over the list uh, six times and updated those, but as, the, uh, as we had more values in that list, so we actually didn't update the last values there. So this is the very reason why you should always use the kind of range combined with the length function so that you do actually the updates to each, each value uh, of the list no matter how long list or how many items you have there. Cool, then we have one more question for you to think of at the end of here. So again we want to make a poll, so what output would the following program produce? So we have this word ice pellets and then we have the for loop for i in range length word print word i. And again we have uh, the question for you, it should be here. So these are the options that you have. Let's see if I can make it a bit bigger. Yeah. So what of these do you think will come out with the question that we have here? So for i in range length word print word i. So which option is the correct one? And yeah, there's maybe two. one thing to note for the responses for this poll. There's not an easy way in this polling system to list things on separate lines for a single response. So the values that are separated by commas would be yeah, displayed new, on new. separate lines, mm -hmm. just to be clear. And uh, perhaps we can take like a ten minute break and yeah, we can take the take the result. Sort of, yeah, you know. Stretch your legs a little bit and uh, we'll check the results after.